Well, as you probably as you probably know by now, our, our wonderful guest today is again Miranda McPherson, and um, it's very easy because Miranda is so easy to be with, and she makes the whole event so easy to forget how accomplished she is and what a journey she's been on herself. She started in Australia. She had a very successful career out there in television, but she knew there was something more that she wanted to do, so she left her home country. She went to England. She had a very successful career in England, and then something was still was pulling her, and now she, here she is in America. She's, left, she's written several books. We're very, very excited that we're just waiting arrival for the, the latest book, which is The Way of Grace, The Transforming Power of Ego Relaxation. And uh, we had hoped to have that for you today, and um, that is not the case. But they will be in the mind shop in the next couple of days. So Miranda's topic today is humility, bowing to the mystery. And so can we, with great respect and love, welcome Miranda McPherson. <laughs> Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you again. Who here was here last Sunday when I was here? Great. So the way I've really set this up is that I wanted to give two teachings that come out of my new book, which actually is hitting the stores in November. So the book that David was mentioning is the audio book on boundless love, which will be coming soon. But um, this book on grace, I've been really working on a long time, and the teaching that I gave last Sunday was on cultivating trust, which is out of a section on how we receive the blessings of grace, which is one of the four dimensions of grace. It's a pretty deep book. So the teaching that I'm going to be giving today is on humility. And to get us actually into the felt sense of humility, I wanted us to do a chant that I'm sure will not be unfamiliar to you. Um, the, just the version of it is fresh, perhaps. But it's Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya. Now, this obviously means a bow to the Absolute. Please dissolve everything in the way. But it's also a way that we merge our consciousness we merge back into our divine self. And so as we're singing the chant together, and you'll pick it up, um, you might, if you like to visualize, you might visualize or just see without trying too hard, as if you're merging into an infinite ocean of light. Just let yourself go there. Let the sound, the music, help you lean in that direction. So I'll start. Find your way into it.
be still and lay aside all thoughts of what you are, what God is, all images you hold about yourself, all you think is true or false, good or bad. Empty your mind. Hold on to nothing. Do not cling to one thing you learned before about anything. Just open here, now, wherever you are. Just come with wholly empty hands unto God. This is really the invitation that is being given to every one of us all the time. This is what surrender involves. And if you were here last Sunday, you all have heard me say that grace, which is the direct living presence of the divine, of what we are, cannot really be conceptualized, it comes alive through some kind of surrender, which isn't amputating the parts of ourself that we think shouldn't be there. It's not a kind of rejection. It's really a very graceful happening when it truly happens. When true surrender happens, it feels as if you're not doing anything because there's no you anymore. So surrender itself is more like a soft yielding back into the source of our being. And while it's the most natural thing in the world, we come up against a lot of resistance in ourself in the process of letting that yield happen. And it's because of this that I've written a book about it. And one of the teachings within the book is really looking at what we can do that helps us to become more receptive, more truly available for that yield to happen so that we can truly cross over the shore in our consciousness, both in ways that allow us to become more in contact, intimate, with the deeper and more subtle nectars, gifts, blessings, things that truly resolve our stress, our struggle, our conflicts, bring us very deeply into the condition of total peace. And yet, it requires our participation. It requires us to build a certain kind of spiritual musculature all so that we can actually just be still, which isn't necessarily just meditating, although we all know that helps. It is this quieting, ceasing and desisting of the trying to direct, control, lead our own way. And if you've been engaging serious spiritual practice for a while, I'm sure you've already know that the, the ego can't be in charge of the process of surrender. It's an oxymoron, right? So it's this paradox, engaging deep spiritual practices, building a certain kind of spiritual muscular, all so we can let go. And as we let go, we become more graceful in every way. We become less defensive. We become less armored. We become more permeable to 
subtle dimensions, we are more transparent to our own true nature. And so the gifts of the divine and our beautiful essential qualities are freely available. So for this we need not only trust, which is what I was speaking of last week, that gives us the platform that we can actually just be here in the present, we can be undefended, we can meet what's so both on that interior and exterior level and relax fear and control, we also need humility. So humility is this all-important quality that deals with and melts that ego feature of pride. So in the same way that fear is a feature of ego consciousness, control is a feature of ego consciousness, so too is pride. And even if you don't consider yourself an obviously prideful, aggrandizing person, as I'm sure you're not, it's there in a subtle way that we need to understand and see and let it melt, which is what ego relaxation is about, true surrender is really about. So you only have to look at a photograph of someone like Ramana Maharshi, and I happen to have a photograph here. Take a look at this beautiful face. You could also take a look at the face of Nelson Mandela, of the Dalai Lama. And it's obvious the beauty of a human being devoid of the puffiness of pride, the sheer luminous beauty does not need any fancy this or that. It just is so beautiful. Our true nature, when all of these dense aspects of the ego are relaxed and resolved, is just exquisite. So it shows us, these great beings show us that humility is evidence that some awakening has happened, right? It's a feature that is just naturally there when there has been some realization and some spiritual maturation. Humility is also a virtue that we can cultivate like a muscle that helps us to mature, helps us to relax and let go of the defensive pride. But what isn't known so well is that humility is also a gate into the celestial state of pristine purity, spontaneous availability to subtle nectars beyond construct of me and mine. So how do we open to that? I want to quantify what I'm saying by saying that pride, all, all pride isn't bad. Like, for example, we know that it's important to build healthy self-esteem in our children by mirroring their positive attributes and skills, by giving them that support so that they take pride in their accomplishments Right. In the same way that it doesn't have to become a spiritual block or problem to feel proud of yourself when you've really applied yourself with dedication to write a book, or cook a beautiful meal, or learn a new skill or master a musical instrument. It can just be a, a true acknowledgement of applying yourself and a development happening that's quite beautiful. But the pride that's problematic is where we start taking personal credit for the gifts that have been placed in us. Where we reify, reconstitute 
that notion that we're the one doing it and therefore it makes us special. And this can easily creep in after deep openings. We can start to relate even to spiritual openings that we've had as this achievement that, you know, we have somehow achieved rather than really staying intimate with the fact that something way deeper than we can even name is causing us to draw breath, is causing our heart to beat, is causing you to want to be in this room and engage with what I'm saying, is causing you to recognize the truth of what I'm pointing to. That is not to anyone's personal credit. That belongs to the power, the glory, that is forever and ever. And therefore, when we recognize that, of course, we are in the rightful, humble posture, which is not some imitation of something we might take on if we've kind of been watching other people and we think we take on some imitation of what humility is. I don't know about you, but I've always felt that a little cringeworthy and I've spent a lot of time in ashrams and spiritual communities where you can see there's a posturing of humility that's not really authentic. Actually, it's even building more of an ego, I'm now being humble. Like, it's kind of funny and challenging. And, you know, a dear friend of mine who you might know, Russ Hudson, the Enneagram teacher, wrote a wonderful book called The Wisdom of the Enneagram. He said, he, I sat to dinner with him the other night and he said, well, if you think you're a humble person, you're probably not. <laughs> right? right? So it's, it's so subtle, this tendency of our ego to appropriate you know, spiritual development, spiritual states, wisdom that we've accrued, and to really forget that the spiritual path doesn't ask us to negate ourselves. It's not a putting down, you know, to relax into being nothing and no one is not a put down. It is an invitation to yield, to keep yielding, not for it to have a one shot, to just to keep yielding, to keep relaxing back into that primordial, pristine state of, wow, I don't know, I mean, really. And that protects us from getting hard or fixed or dense or impenetrable to fresh understanding and insight and it helps us to stay in right relationship with the mystery of our own being and the mystery of whoever is sitting next to us, even if they've been sitting next to us for 40 years and we think we know them. Like, who here is married? Right. So, you know, when you're married and you've been together a long time, it's very easy to take one another for granted and to so get a little bored and think, oh yeah, I know that person. They get bit, become a bit like a pair of old socks after a while. We can relate to them as that. You don't mean to, but it can get like that. And it's partly why is because we've moved away from the humility of even though we've been together for 40 years, you're a sacred mystery a sacred mystery. What, what don't I know about you? Like, so notice how when we take that attitude, there's this, there's this fresh, very pure openness, receptivity to discover what is sacred, to have what is sacred come alive in some way we hadn't known or seen before. And this is the secret to why humility is so important for us. 
on every level because it helps us to stay open, to keep being pure, to keep everything fresh both as we look inside on the meditation cushion and as we look at one another and as we look at whatever life is dishing out right now and let's never forget the fact that life has a mysterious way of popping our pride from time to time, doesn't it? And it comes mysteriously. Last week I shared how there are times on the spiritual path where we are lit up with inspiration and excitement and joy. It's as if the divine gardener is coming at us with fertilizer. <laughs> and it's great. And then there's times when the divine gardener is walking towards us with pruning shears. <laughs> right? And so when the pruning shears are coming our way, Instinctually, very rarely, do we say, oh, goody. <laughs> but humility helps us to say, okay, yes, okay, yes, rather than no. And as we say yes, recognizing, trusting that when the pruning shears are coming, whether that's coming in the form of a demotion in our job, a difficult patch, in our marriage or some challenge that might be happening with our bodies, with a health condition or some financial loss that we weren't anticipating. These things are not easy. I mean, let's face it, it is not easy to say yes when those things are being brought forth. And yet, if we can trust, that gives us the platform for humility, then we can actually recognize that when we're being asked to let go of something, when life is bringing a pruning, it is for our benefit. It is because what is here is no longer really useful. Now, of course, not according to our ego, but according to divine will, which as we trust divine will, as we trust that the foundation of existence is loving inherently, we can recognize that when we're asked to let go, it's because something has been outlived. It's not serving our spiritual evolution anymore. So we become more graceful when we say, okay, when we surrender to that. It's not collapse. It doesn't mean defeat. It's not someone winning and someone losing. It is a deeper opening where we can really allow the truth of emptying out, of really letting go, not with self-directed effort, but again, relaxing back into the mystery of divine intelligence as it's unfolding. I will never forget a very dear friend of mine who's on the other side now. He had one of the biggest pops of his pride that I have ever seen in a person. He was one of New York City's top doctors, had a very prestigious career, a lot of money, and he went through this really awful um, legal status, illegal challenge by an angry former patient. And it took everything. It took his status, it took his money, it took his role, it took his career. I saw most of his friends just avoiding him. It was very public. And it was heartbreaking, very difficult to watch as his friend. But, and he ended up going to prison. Um, for something he said he never did. So it was very hard. And after all of this, I remember, you know, walking with him in New York City and we were walking his dog. And he was scooping up the poop from his dog. And I was asking him in the conversation, you know, how are you doing really? And he looked up at me and he said, prison was the best thing that happened to me. I'd become so prideful, so fake. 
It was shocking and powerful to hear that. It really impacted my heart because I could feel that it wasn't a platitude. It really was the truth of his experience. He says, I'm so much more at peace. I'm happier. I feel real. In the years that followed, you know, he went through a journey with leukemia and every time I would see him, I was more and more moved because I saw this beautiful quality of humility pouring out of him. There was such nobility in who he became that I always think of him in my heart as a graceful embodiment of true humility, of humble surrender. And I know in my heart he died a free man, truly at peace with himself, a life very well lived, beautiful. So I could recount so many stories like this of people that I've worked with who've journeyed through cancer and my own journeys too, of having to work through with things that were really, really hard that asked for, you know, a surrender of everything. You've heard, if you've heard me speak before, of the awakening that happened in 2005 in Ramana Maharshi's cave, but what I don't talk about so much is what went on in the years after that, that just kept coming for all of my attachments, just kept coming very deep pruning and I remember one night meditating on my sofa because I couldn't sleep and I had quieted, quieted down, I had become still enough to be able to truly pray and truly listen and I remember asking the question, it was a prayer really and my prayer was help me to really understand what this is for so I can say yes to it and what came back was an interesting series of questions. Who are you without? So you imagine if you were asked to, who are you without? And then go through your list, all of your attachments. My list was something like this. Who are you without your friends? Who are you without your marriage, who are you without your social standing, who are you without your role as teacher, who are you without, it kept going, it was a long list, I had lots of attachments, we all do, it's, it's human, we all do, and it's not wrong either. But the last question was the real kicker, because it was who are you, and I was writing these down by the way, I was working in my journal. Who are you without Miranda? Now I'm writing the M of my name and the pen ran out. <laughs> Ding dong. It was this intense moment. I just was started to shake. And I got it. Yes. Well, it's a little bit like the dust in India. It's going to get into everything after a while. So that's what happens when you really enter deeply into the spiritual path is that you start to see that the spiritual path is everything. It wants to pervade absolutely everything about you and your life. It wants to get into how you are with money. It wants to wake you up in how you are in your marriage. It wants to wake you up on the meditation cushion. It wants to help you be more real and pure and true as you interact with the clock at Whole Foods. It wants to help you be more real and true as you walk your dog on the beach. It wants to help you be purely what you actually are all the time. That's where all this is going, right? Because that's what sets you free. That's what makes you truly happy. That's what brings you back into right relationship with the mystery that you are. And it requires you to empty out all thoughts and all presumptions. 
even your presumptions of what you are. Let's do a simple experiment right now. Just notice what your eyes are lighting on. Doesn't matter what it is. Maybe it's me, maybe it's this color, maybe it's the podium, maybe it's the floor, maybe it's other people in the room. Just notice what your eyes are lighting on. Now, consider, do you really know what it is that you're seeing? Do you? I know we think we do. We think, oh, that's a chair, that's the color green. That's a blonde lady, that's a purple top, that's a podium. But how come? Consider this. When you were little, one of your elders very lovingly and patiently taught you what things are. You might have remember being taught a song. Head and shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. Right. Someone patiently said, this is a head, this is hair, this is a shoulder, this is knees, this is toes, this is an eye, this is a hand, this is what it's for. Right? So you got that transmission and education from your elders, we all did, that gives us what we call consensus ordinary reality. But it's really labels and agreements. Only part of what's happening in that stage of development is that we are being given an, a label and a meaning for what things are at a time when our consciousness is forming its platform for reality. And once it's formed, we just don't question it. We don't question, is that all there is to know? Is that really what there is? Take a breath. So what I'm really pointing to is everything you think you see might not be all there is to see because we can't help but be looking out at everything and everyone, including ourselves, through a pre-existing network of filters. And if we are unwilling to question those, then we're blocked from opening into galaxies of grace, my friends. Galaxies of things that are also here and also you that really blow apart our pre-existing framework for what we are, what God is, what the world is. Which is why A Course in Miracles asks us, empty your mind of everything you think is true or false, good or bad. Hold on to nothing. Don't cling to one thing you learn before about anything, including, my friends, your spiritual knowledge. Because if you don't cling, there's no defense. No defense, no barrier. No barrier, infinite possibility. Infinite possibility total spontaneity for you to be a portal to be an embodiment of that which we can only really bow to that and when we come into contact with it inwardly bowing is total and natural in the years following the awakening in the cave, I had the great, great blessing of being able to sit with an enlightened female saint in India. She's not very well known. Her name is Shiva Shakti Amaya. You could look her up. Shiva Shakti Amaya, the silent one. So she would give darshan twice a day, this time in Tiruvannamalai. And I found her presence so supportive and calming, especially because I'd been so pruned and was so raw and I uh, found being with her very calming and settling, soothing to my nervous system. And three years, after three years of sitting with her as often as I could on numerous trips to India, I was offered a private meeting with her. Of course, I jumped at that chance. 
I thought I knew what to expect. I'd been sitting with her for three years. I also had a little aversion to the whole Westerners that would do this prostrating thing. I thought it was a little phony and fake. So I go around the little flimsy bamboo curtain to have my private session with her. What happens? Full prostration, total tears. I am completely blasted open and awe, absolute, unspeakable awe at the fact that the light, light, truth was everything. And in that moment, I am nothing. And wow, how beautiful. How beautiful. What grace. What grace to just be nothing and nowhere, to be that gone, to be that in the presence of the power and the glory and the light. And I understood finally why I had always been so moved as a child. I didn't come from a religious family, but maybe like you, we said the Lord's Prayer at assembly in school. And I always felt like I wanted to cry at that line in the Lord's Prayer, where it says, for thine is the power and the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Really? Really? That's the truth. That's what we submit to. That's what we give ourselves back to. And it's joyful. It's exquisite. We are refreshed. We are restored. We are at the fountain. There's no more I or you. There's no concept of God. There's none of that nonsense. Reality is, we are, and it's humble. We are finally in the back seat of the car, settling, enjoying the ride. So what causes you, really? What elicits that humble, true, deep bowing reverence in you? What prompts it? What brings that forward? That allows a totality, unhesitating totality, to say yes to this mystery, whatever you want to call it. Have your way. Thy will is my will, always, really. That's what makes everything graceful. That's what brings us to the fulfillment that we've been seeking in so many strange ways. That's where we see through, with love, of course, the folly of fantasizing that we were ever the doer or the creator of anything. We're not. We just are, by grace. So, I have a song for you. I'll surrender. Yeah. I have to get this shot. <laughs> So I'm going to sing the verses, and you can join me in the chorus. The chorus is very simple. I am. Radiant flame within my heart, help me to recognize all thou art, help me to see thyself show mind how to fall all of thy glories from the sun till earth's great victory is won I am the love so after all I am the love so hear my call I am
Hello. 